This is podcast, 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 episode number forty-eight. Um, doing it a little bit differently. We've we've moved our recording studios from our kitchen to the basement. Um, the baby Lillian, our little one, is upstairs right now, and you can hear her a little bit probably in the background. She's about to go down for a nap, so mom and her upstairs. So Ben and I moved downstairs. Um, it's probably. Um, an indicator of how fancy we are. Uh, we, we don't have studios. We do, uh, we do it in our house. So, um, but I don't think it matters. I think, I think the nice part about it is today, um, I see people and I think it's interesting and I kind of, we're, we're probably going to do some of it. Um, I see people recording podcasts on the go. I mean, they're, the the it's it's just something that's become doesn't need to be super formal and we certainly are not that formal so uh to go along with that um we're gonna be a little bit looser in our format here um just because i'm not in the comfort of my kitchen so i've I, we're gonna go off of our phone i'm gonna go off my phone um and and kind of get the source of some of the questions so today it's going to be driven by instagram heavily actually um, got several messages. I've gotten a couple of messages that, um, and, and it's been real positive, the feedback that we've gotten, um, from the podcast specifically. And I've gotten several different people have said, I binge listen to the podcast and I think it's awesome. I love it. Um, because I have, I have had some, um, things that I've come across over the last, eh, 15, 20 years that I have binge consumed a little bit myself. Um, I've gotten into certain things and all of a sudden I just try to consume as much information as I can about it. And and to think that we're able to provide some of that. Um, and actually that's Bella upstairs that you can hear in her kennel. So uh, everyone thinks that Bella is, it walks on water. Well, she squeaks at times too in her kennel. So um, she's a little fussy. Um, so you'll hear that in the background. So again, I think it's... Um, it's probably very unprofessional. Uh, it's probably very unpolished. Um, it doesn't look good. Doesn't sound good um, to have a dog whine in the background. But I also think it's reality. So we deal with it. It drives me nuts. Um, that sound is like uh, someone shoving knives in my ears. I hate the sound of it. But I'm gonna deal with it. And if it gets to be too much and she doesn't settle down, I'll send Ben up, and Ben can go and tell her to be quiet. Um, she should not have to go outside. We worked her. Ben and I filmed um, with Bella earlier today. We filmed the episode of Bella Be Good, which Bella Be Good is a series that we're doing um, documenting her training. Um, available on our YouTube channel, at Dogbone Hunter. Um, shameless little plug for that, but I think that that is a, a series that I'm really enjoying. We're, we're posting them. We filmed them um, a lot more frequently. Early on, we've we've slowed down a bit during deer season with it, um, but I, it was a reminder today when we filmed that we need to be more consistent. Um, and that was one of my takeaways and one of my points that I made was, she struggles when we're not consistent and we haven't been consistent. So we're going to um, we're going to change that. I think we're going to make a point of changing it. So uh, again, very realistic. So not polished and not fancy. But if you if you've listened to forty seven other one of these, you'll realize by now we're not. So um, it's just our that's just the style that we have. Anyway, today we're going to go with Instagram. So I've got my phone here and I've got a question that I'm going to answer. Um, it came. And I'll read it to you. It came on Instagram as a direct message. It says, I want to start off by saying I love the podcast. So again, I don't know that you guys realize how important it is and how much it means to me and us, Ben and I, um, our whole team, when we hear that these things are bringing value. But um, she starts off saying, I love the podcast. Listen to all the episodes in preparation for the puppy I'm getting in the spring, which I love the idea of that. She's really planning ahead. I plan on getting it. Uh, I plan on getting in the spring. I've also purchased your puppy starter pack and working through your YouTube videos. So she's really doing her homework uh, is what stands out to me. It says, I have grown up with labs and have come to love the breed, but this will be my first puppy. I've looked into a couple British lab breeders online that have caught my interest, but have yet to contact them. I'm curious as to what you look for in breeders, their dogs, and what questions you recommend asking before committing. I live in New Hampshire and will have 
will likely have to travel far and will not be able to visit the kennel before picking up the puppy. I plan to hunt pheasants and duck as well as track deer. Any advice and recommendations are appreciated. Thanks, Hannah. And then she said this might be a good podcast question. I think it's a great podcast question. Um, I'm sure a lot of people probably think this. We've been asked it before. I've touched on it probably a little bit over the years. Um, and to be honest with you, my my over the years, I've shifted um, in some of the things I look for. So I think it's a great question. I, I, I'm going to touch, I'm going to, I'm going to answer it as honest as I can. And I'm going to answer it as honest as I can from my, um, from my approach and my feelings. I think that, you know, it varies. And I think, um, I, what I don't want to turn it into is I don't want to turn this into a commercial. I don't want to turn it into a commercial for any kennels in specific, you know, specifically or, or turn or, or negative, positive or negative towards any kennels. Because I do think that the key is finding the right fit. Um, and that means it, it means matching up the right, this, this, um, Hannah is the one who sent me the question in my situation. It's me in Ben's, it's him, it's in whoever situation it is. It's finding the right fit for them and for the dog. And I think there's a combination of things that need to line up. So I think first off is the style lifestyle. I think lifestyle is really important. So I think you have to take into consideration. Now, you brought up the idea that you've looked into a couple British lab breeders. I think that's important. So I think we can just talk some real X's and O's stuff on it. Um, British labs or UK bred labs, that's my preference. Um, that's what you guys have seen me with for the last 15 years, 16 years ago, I think is when I bought my first one. Um, and I had American dogs before that. Um, and I don't think there's anything wrong with, with either. Um, I think it's a different style. I think it's a different preference. But the the British dog has become really popular, um, particularly in the last probably 10 to 15 years. Uh, it's what got me hooked, um, that, that time period, that window. Um, and, and what got me was the Ducks Unlimited mascot. Drake, the Ducks Unlimited mascot, who uh, Wild Rose Kennels um, owned and, and trained. And I watched it on a TV show that was a DU show. Um, and then I went and saw the dog at a DU event, and I just fell in love with everything about how they approached their training with, with Drake, the DU dog, and the type of dog that he was. Um, it's what inspired me to buy my first one, uh, my first British dog. So, But I think the important, there's some important stuff that needs to be touched on before we even get into that is the idea of British labs, English labs, I've heard people call them. Um, I think you got to be very careful. I had someone message me that they're buying an English lab. This was a little while ago, a year ago, maybe six months ago. They're buying an English, a can, a, they have a kennel that they're buying from that breeds English labs. And he's he wanted to make sure, wanted to get my thoughts on it. And I said, well, you know, I don't know the kennel, um, so I don't know the dogs. And I think you have to have some knowledge of that to be able to kind of speak intelligently about it. So I said, I don't have that. But... I one th word that really stands out is English versus British. Um, there's a tendency or a, 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 a standard that when you start talking about English dogs, primarily, almost always, they're talking about dogs that are um, show dogs, bred for the bench. Um, they're they're bred for confirmation. They're bred for looks. Um, so a show dog and a field dog are very different, and I think. When, when the craze over here in the States and the, and the, the, the popularity grew for these UK style dogs, um, I think there were kennels over here that saw opportunity for that and started bringing in dogs um, from Europe, bringing in some of these UK type dogs, quote unquote. Well, I think some of the people bought English dogs that were bred for show they looked really nice they were handsome and i think people talk about the looks of them they always talk about i hear people talk about um you know they have blocky heads they're shorter legged they're stockier um those are all looks things and that has really nothing to do with them in the field um i get it english this if you're talking about an english show dog those would be important things um they're not important to me as a hunter so 
I look for a, what, what's referred to as a British style dog. British could be it's UK, it could be Northern Ireland, um, it could be England, it could be Scotland, but those dogs are field dogs, and I think that you have to understand that that dog has been bred with priorities and those priorities first and foremost lend themselves to the field so natural game finding really good noses um, that's really important um, temperament and disposition is very important and i don't know that it's not in the show dogs or not i, I don't know much about the show dogs um, other than what they look like um, and then you can look up specs on them as far as confirmation requirements but the personality the disposition the temperament those are things that are important in transfer into the field uh, for hunting dog, uh, especially for the type of hunting dogs that these guys over there are look, guys and girls I shouldn't say guys, but guys and girls are looking for and breeding for, uh, because they build those dogs around their trial systems and their trial systems are very different than ours. So, I like that. Um, it's what fits well when I talk about matching styles. It fits the style of hunting that I do here. It fits the style of lifestyle that I do here with the dogs. So I think you got to be careful there. So this guy that had messaged me and said, I'm looking at this English dog. I sent him back a message. I said, be careful um, that when you say you've got an, a breeder that's breeding English dogs, make sure they're come from they, that they hunt those dogs. Those dogs come from field lines over in the UK, not necessarily show lines. He messaged me back. He said, I'm really glad you brought it to my attention. These were show dogs. So he got his deposit back and then he started on his search looking for a field dog. Um, but it matched, it needed to match what he was looking to do. So with Hannah, she, she knows what she's looking to do. She's looking to do upland with pheasants. She's going to do waterfall, gun dog work as a duck dog, and then she wants to track deer. So I do think that the idea of a dog with natural game finding ability is probably very valuable. Um, strong noses. I think that having a dog with a really good calm disposition and temperament is going to be very nice for you. If you're going to be a family dog, it's a must for me. If you're going to have a gun dog, I think it's a must. If you're going to have a tracking dog, I think it's a must. If you're going to have a pheasant dog, an upland dog, I think it's a must. And the reason I say it is because out in the field, one or the other, you know, I prefer a dog that's easily controlled. Uh, I, I emphasize and talk about control a lot in building that foundation early on in training. But the idea of them in the lodge with you at night, in your cabin with you, in your house with you, at the kids' soccer games with you, because you're only gonna hunt for a few months out of the year. The rest of the year, what are you gonna do with the dog? It's not an ATV that you park in the, in the shed. It's not something that we only use during the season. So I need one that is gonna be able to do a lot of things year round and be enjoyed doing them. I have as I enjoy my dogs as much in the evenings by the fire as I do in the field. Well, sometimes sometimes I like it in the field too, but it it's it's something that I need to be able to transfer with the dogs. So I think that that lends itself really well to what I'm looking to do with them. Now, uh, I think when we start, we can circle back to kind of these field trials. The style of dog that's built to compete in a UK style field trial is a dog that um, is required to do some things that aren't, to me, there's some of them are very much um, utilitarian in the field, like good noses, abilities to, to take lines and, and handle some in the field, get put into a position of where a bird went down and then naturally be able to find it, natural game finding. Those are all important things. Um, but I also think, you know, being quiet, um, not being a nuisance, um, be not taking away from the hunt. Now over there, the hunts are totally different. So you got to have a little bit of an understanding of that. Um, they're not like a, a hunt over here in the States. Um, they're, they're, they're hunts on estates. They're, they're very formal. Um, they're, they're, the emphasis is on the shoot, not necessarily on the dogs. So the dogs are an intricate part of it. But I think it's also a part that it's like a referee in a game. Like the referee is an important part of the game, but the referee should not be the focal point. Um, the referee should not draw a lot of attention. Um, they're there to do a job. And so I think the dogs are, are looked at that way over there. So, so I think 
that style um, of, of hunt needs a dog that can be a little, rela- a little relaxed at times, a little laid back at times. And I, I, I cringe at saying those words because I think when people think that, they think they're lazy. Um, and it's the last thing I think these dogs are. Um, I think these dogs are super intelligent. And I think they have the ability to not just be super athletic. I think they have a really nice mix of athleticism and intelligence. And I think they match those well. I think they have the ability to turn things on in the field and then turn them off when they're in the field or when they're not in the field. And so to me, that's a real important part of it. Um, So what do I look for from a kennel standpoint? I want to match the style of dogs that they're producing. Because I do think that most kennels specialize in certain styles of dogs. Um, I think um, some don't know what they specialize in. I think that becomes very evident in conversation. I think some are very niche and very custom and they're very much looking to build a certain type of dog. I like that personally. Um, It's usually done on a relatively small scale. Um, I like that because it, it... I like it if it fits what I'm looking for. If it's not exactly what I'm looking for, well, then I move on to the next. Um, I do think that, you know, you asked what are some of the questions. I think some of the stuff that I, I think you want to make sure of is when it comes to the kennel, you, you know, you here's the thing. You have a tool. Like I'm, I'm reading your question right now on my phone. I'm looking at my computer. I actually have two kennels up on my computer right now on my on my. Uh, Google Chrome or whatever you call that. Um, I've got a kennel, Fenderwood Kennels, which is over in, in England. And I have Blue Cypress Kennels, which is here in the States. That's where I got Bella from. So I'm writing an article right now. I have those two kennels minimized on my desktop. Um, I'm writing an article about a dog that I'm training that came from Blue Cypress, whose sire is from Fenderwood. And so I research a lot of websites now, um, these days. Uh, especially because I've gotten to know a lot more about the dogs, about the handlers, about the, the breeders. And so I use it as a tool to research. You've got a phone that you probably sent me a message on Instagram on that you can look up the exact same information. So I think we're really kind of in a good spot with the ability to get a lot of information. But I would, I would start with searching kennels um, you know that are that are going to fit your type of dog that you're looking for so if you're looking for a british field dog that's what i'd be googling um, then i'd start digging into i look for a few things behind the scenes before i really start narrowing it down first off i like to look at um, and i like to get feedback now i think it's important to realize i think forums suck in a lot of ways because it's a really loud there's a lot of spots where people are really loud um, and negative but I also think you can get a feel or get some get get an understanding of what you may or may not want to research into based on some people's feedback. But I do think you can find out an awful lot pretty quickly when it comes to reviews. I mean, we're an Amazon type world and how many stars things have dictate whether or not we buy. So I think dogs and kennels can be the same. I just think you got to take everything with a little bit of a grain of salt. Um, but I think you can get a good feel of things to look out for or kennels to look out for and be a little cautious of. And then some that go, wow, man, they just, they've got an outstanding track record. Um, but I would research it in, in started out online. I'd look online and I'd, when you start talking about, you're looking for a British style dog. Um, I look at some of the training, um, uh, because I think you got to match the lifestyle, the training style and the hunt style. The hunt style is probably going to be a fit. Most of the kennels you look at are probably going to talk about doing some upland, probably look at some gun dog. The tracking part, maybe not, but tracking for big game. But I, th- I can tell you right now, tracking big game stuff is the e- one of the easiest trainings you'll have um, with, this, with, these do- with most dogs. Not just these dogs, but most dogs because it comes so natural to them. It's using their nose. It's game finding. And so good game finders are are sporting dogs so whether they're tracking a crippled pheasant or a wounded deer it really doesn't matter it's just a different introduction of training and scent discrimination so the skill set i think is there um we just have to bring it out of them but what i look at is training styles so i don't know hannah what your training style is if you've been listening to all of our podcasts um you'll know i use a real low pressure um i don't put a lot of force on the pups 
I don't put a lot of force on the older dogs. I don't use collars. I don't use shock collars. Um, a British part of the reason I love the British style of training and dogs is because they do not use them. They don't. And so you come over here and you, you and I, and I, I get a little cautious cause I don't want to, I don't want to be bagging on stuff, but I look at a lot of websites that are British style, British kennels, British trainers, British breeders, and they're talking about force fetch and they're talking about collar conditioning and they're talking about using that, those techniques on those dogs. And my question immediately goes to that dog was bred so that you didn't have to have that. So if you have, my question is, is do you have to use those styles to train that dog? Or do you choose to use that style to train that dog? And if you do, how does the dog respond to it? Because there are different types of dogs out there. And some dogs take pressure a lot better. An, an, a, an American field trial dog takes pressure a lot more, uh, a lot more easily than this style of dog that I'm working with. It's a fact. It's not good, bad, or indifferent. I don't care if you use collars. I don't care if you do field trials. I think they're really impressive. I personally just don't have a lot of interest in them. Um, I think it's I think it's totally dependent on what your interests are and what you want to do with your dogs. I like to hunt them, so I'm not interested in winning ribbons. I'm not interested in winning trophies. I prefer to hunt, and so and I'm not saying you can't do both, but I know a lot of dogs that don't do both, and so like throws like, and when you start talking about the the dogs the lineage of these dogs were breeders are breeding to develop a type of dog and they breed a dog to fit a list of duties that they want them to do and so i want to make sure that when i get this dog if it's a british style dog and they're putting collars on them i'm going how come is it because they have to and if it's because they have to in order to get the get what they need to what the, what we want to get out of them from a training standpoint, to me, it's the wrong dog. It's, it's not the right dog for me. I want to use, I, there's a reason I buy this style of dog and that is because it doesn't need a collar. I'm not a collar trainer. I'm not a force trainer. I'm not a avoidance trainer. I don't, I don't do, I just, just it's just my preference. Now I know some people probably listen to this and get upset about it and I don't care. Um, I used to care about it a little bit. I don't care about it anymore because I've decided that there's a lot of people that probably agree and don't want to do it that way. Um, they'd like to do it without force. They'd like to do it without collars. And so I think the reason why a lot of people have not been able to do it that way is because they didn't know it could be done. And so I've been very lucky. Um, I've, I've been able to talk with, work with, watch um, listen to um, a lot of really, really good trainers that don't use collars. Um, the, kennel, uh, the kennels I have up on my computer right now, Fenderwood, the guy's name is Andy, uh, David Latham. And he's got a brother, Andy Latham, that just ran in the IGL like last weekend, I think. Um, but David Latham has some videos. I bought them. Like I had to, I had to get special videos because they were made in Europe and um, they had to be converted so that they play over here. But anyway, I, I got these videos and watched him. Now I got them a little bit later. Um, one of the most one of the most influential guys, um, not necessarily directly because I didn't really work with him directly, but I worked. I bought his dogs. Was Mike Stewart from Wild Rose Kennels? Um, I I feel his. It was him and Drake from the Ducks and the Ducks Unlimited dog that really sold me on the idea of you can do this with a dog and you can do it this way. And so, probably sh completely sh shifted and changed my dog training direction um, way back in 2003, probably 2004. Um, so it it it's I've been lucky enough to see a lot of that. Um, Blue Cypress Kennels. I met the guy from Blue Cypress Kennels while he was working at Wild Rose Kennels. Um, there's a guy, Josh um, Dewitt. Josh Dewitt has a kennel called Brookstone Kennels. Um, I, I know Josh through Wild Rose Kennels is how I met him. Um, but I, he, he is another guy that, um, I, I like following his stuff on, on Facebook. I like following his stuff on Instagram. He's got a kennel that I would highly recommend looking into. 
I think he's he's probably these days he's more the style of kennel that I would look towards. Um, Blue Cypress Kennel is where I bought Bella from um, on purpose, um, and that came because I researched the kennel. I knew someone there. I researched and talked to them. I talked about their vision as far as their their direction with their dogs, what they're looking to produce, what style of dog. I looked at the um, paperwork, which back in the day, the paperwork didn't mean much to me. And to a lot of people, the paperwork's not going to mean much to them. Because if you don't know the dogs on it, it doesn't help you. But I, over the last 15 years, I've been able to really kind of follow along with certain dogs and get a feel for them and train puppies out of them and train puppies out of puppies out of them. And so I've, I've been able to, over the years, collect enough information on dogs where now I can have confidence and say, I like this lineage out of this dog and it can go back to this kennel, which came back from this kennel. And now all of a sudden we're back, you know, five, six generations and we're over in, you know, over, over overseas with them. And so, but 10 years ago, I didn't have that information. I, I just didn't know enough back then. I didn't know enough about the different dogs. Um, this dog, Bella, that I'm training right now is specifically because it came from a Fendua dog. And, uh, there are, there are dogs I've, I've been to lots of kennels. Um, Robert Milner has a really good kennel down in, in Tennessee. I've trained dogs from him. Wild Rose has a, amazing facilities. Um, lots of different dogs. I've trained lots of different dogs from them. Blue Cypress. Now we've got, I'm, I'm training a puppy from, I've been to m- multiple other kennels, not bought dogs from them, but visited and, and talked with. And just recently, I've been in, in search of another style of dog that I'm looking at. Um, and, and I'm talking with, I, I'm in the exact same boat Hannah is right now looking for um, a pointing dog, actually. So that, I didn't even think about this, but I'm looking for a setter. Um, I think I'm looking for a setter. I'm not even sure yet. So that tells you how confident I am. But I'm looking for a pointing dog. I've looked at some pointers. I've looked at setters. I've looked at different styles of setters. I've contacted and talked with multiple breeders um some of them i have decided not to get dogs from and i never saw their dogs i never once saw their dogs and i decided i'm not going to get a dog from this guy i'm not going to get a dog from these people because i didn't get the right feel on the business end of it um some of them i've contacted and i am definitely going to see their dogs and i don't know if they have the best dogs yet because i haven't seen them but the amount of contact that I've had with them and the interaction I've had with them um, started off, one of, the, one of the places started off probably uh, 10 years ago. I sent the guy an email 10 years ago. I still have the email saved. But I was interested in getting a pointing dog back then. I sent the guy an email and he sent the email back to me and invited me to his place to see his dogs. I mean, it was everything I wanted. Um, so fast forward nine years, a year ago, I think it was about 10 years ago, but so a year ago, I sent the guy another email and I said, Hey, I reached out to you a long time ago, blah, 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 blah. And he responded back anytime you want to come up and visit. No problem. blah blah. So I have a list of kennels that I'm going to be going to visit. Um, now I know you said that you're a long ways away, so you won't be able to visit. I get it. I do recommend visiting because I think, um, I just think there's a, a lot can be discovered and a lot can be good or bad or or not um on the visit but if you can't i you got to talk to them and i wouldn't mind talking to them multiple times i wouldn't mind talking to them getting letting them tell you a lot the first time that's how i would do it i'd have i'd call with a couple questions and let them tell me as much as they can tell me from that i would talk to the next person the next person the next person then i'd come back with questions and then i'd maybe talk more the second phone conversation but i would call them and i would have multiple conversations with them. I'd send them emails. I'd find out how they communicate. Um, I have had some places in the past that I've decided to not do business with because of that. Um, because it just went, man, I'm having a hard time getting a hold of this guy and having this guy get a hold of me. And I'm a potential customer. What's going to happen if I buy a dog from him and I have a problem? It'll be impossible to get a hold of him. So I think that is an important part. And I think you've got to have the understanding of there's a relationship that's built there beyond the dogs to start out. The second thing I think is really important is health. I think you have to understand their health, what their health guarantees look like, what they do to guarantee or try to guarantee. I don't think you can guarantee 100% anything, either animals. Um, 
there are issues that can come up. So nobody is perfect. And if they tell you they are, I, it's a red flag to me. So I do think that there are issues that come up. It's how do you handle them? How do you deal with them? Um, there are policies that people have, guarantees on puppies. Um, I think you should understand a little bit about what the guarantee really means. Um, there's a lot of places, 24, 26 month is very common. A lot of times that has to do with, you know, they're two years old mature. So if you were able to find out if they had issues like dysplasia, um, if they had eye issues that sometimes show up a little bit later um, down the road, you should be able, you can't certify a dog until they're two years old anyway for hips and elbows. So in, in eyes, so you wouldn't know necessarily. So a lot of times there's a 24 or 26 month guarantee. I think that's great, but I think what you, and, I, and probably necessary, but I think what you have to question is what does the guarantee really mean? There's a lot of places that have it where they'll guarantee it and they'll give you your money back or they'll give you another puppy, but you have to give them your dog back. And I get a big red flag there because I go, nobody's giving their dog back after 18 months. Nobody's giving their dog back at, at two years old. And so I don't believe that's a real good guarantee. In my mind, the guarantee needs to be replacement of the puppy with a puppy or money back and I keep the dog. So I think you should, I think you should be careful of that. Um, I've heard horror stories of people that thought they had a guarantee on the dog. The dog was, had bad issues and the only way they could get anything back was give the dog back. And you know what's going to happen when you give the dog back. So no one's doing it. So it's, it's, uh, it's something that I think you should ask. Um, I think getting an understanding of the individual dogs is important if you can. And so that might mean if you can't go visit them, that might mean find someone who's got a puppy from them. Um, you know, reference lists should be reference reference lists should be available, but be careful of reference lists because it could be Uncle Tom, it could be uh, you know the the buddy down the road. So you got to be careful of that. But I do think that finding out a little bit, you'll be able to tell. Finding out if someone has a puppy out of the one of one or both of those dogs. Um, makes a big difference. Like throws like. So if you want to know what your dog is going to be like, look at mom, look at dad. I put more emphasis on mom than I do dad. And the reason I say that is because dad is, you know, he's 50% of the genetic makeup, but he's only, he's 0% of the cultural impact. So mom is 100% influential for the puppy's first seven or eight, well, seven or eight weeks that they're at the kennel. And quite honestly, it's probably only about four weeks that mom's really influencing. But those are the first four weeks of the puppy's life. And it's 50% of the puppy's life prior to you stepping in. So mom's tendencies will be there um, just as a cultural impact thing. If mom's real nervous and, and antsy and whiny and fussy and noisy and, and yeah, you know, real high energy, um, bouncing off the walls. That's what puppies see for the first half of their life before you see them. Uh, that rubs off. Um, people, they always talk about how dogs and people are so similar. Like when, when someone's dog and them, they're almost like the dog version of the person. I think sometimes it's coincidence. Oftentimes I think it's cultural. And so when you, when, when you see any video, when you see videos of me training, I'm, I'm way faster pace when I'm not training a dog than I am when I'm training a dog. I slow down dramatically. And the reason is because the dog is with me and the dog, I want dogs to move, to operate slow and under control. I don't want them frantic and psychotic. And so if they followed me around in our warehouse, Ben will, ben will attest to this, my dogs would be a little more neurotic because I run around a lot faster and a little bit more uh, chicken with my head cut off. Like I'm, I'm in a lot of, I got a lot of things going and I'm in a lot of different directions. And so I don't want that impacting these young dogs. So I slow things down, I simplify things, I make things a little bit easier and I try to make the pace a little bit, a little bit slower. And so mom, her personality is gonna rub off on those puppies. And so I, and, and that's also, she's also 50% of the genetic makeup. So I think you got to look at that. Um, though like throws like is the best way of saying you you know what your puppy's going to turn out by looking at mom and dad. Um, so those are all things, you know, find out what the people, what the people hunt. 
You know, I, I heard a podcast. Um, we've talked about the Project Upland podcast a little bit on here. The Project Upland podcast, I listened to a, a dog trainer on there or a kennel, a breeder, um, talking about pointing dogs. That's I've gotten a lot of information listening to those podcasts um, from different pointing dogs. And so, but one of those breeders said, I, I forget how he worded it exactly, but I liked it. Um, he talked about finding a, finding a breeder that hunts the way you hunt. Uh, what was it? It was hunts, hunts what you hunt the way you hunt, the way you hunt, something like that. But I, I do think that's important. So I think if you want, if you want to buy a dog that's going to do upland gun dog work and tracking work, don't buy it from, I don't rec- and I'm not saying you can't, I'm not saying you can't have success with this, but I don't recommend buying it from the family that has a go- you know, the dog in the backyard and the neighbor has a dog in the backyard and they bred them together and they have the AKC papers and but well, we don't hunt any of them. None of them, none of them hunt, but they're, they come from hunting lines. I want a dog that's proven. Um, so if you're in that all starts in the beginning here with your Google searches that, that, and you can do all that stuff from your phone. So I probably went in a lot of different directions on this one. Um, we're way we're, we're longer than we normally are, and, and I don't necessarily care that it went a little bit longer. Um, but what there's to to kind of sum it up for Hannah um, and try to make this try to clean this up because I've gone in a lot of different directions with it. Is first off, I think you have you're you're doing the right thing. I know you're doing the right thing because you're really preparing. Like you are. I'm going to bring your thing back up here. You are you are way ahead by listening to podcasts. You are way ahead by buying the puppy packet and watching the videos and looking at YouTube. Like you're so far, most people buy the puppy and then they go look for the stuff. So you're 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 already a planner. You've already looked at some um, breeders online that have caught your interest. I think that's fantastic. Um, I think what you need to do is continue to do that. And now it's a matter of reaching out to some of them. Um, and you can send me a message uh, if you want again. And I and actually you did. And I, I'll maybe shoot you back a message here, let you know that we did the podcast. And then I'll send you a few names too. Um, but, you know, there's there are kennels out there. Wild, Wild Rose is a big one. Um, Southern Oaks is a really big one. I don't know Southern Oak. I, I've not bought a dog from them. I know some of their, I've not trained a dog from them. Um, I've seen some, I know some of their genetics and their bloodlines. Um, they're, they're big, I think, from what I've seen. And I, and I think those two are very similar. I think in the idea of they're, they are really doing a nice job of building a cultural thing. Um, they're building a, they've built the brands and their brands are this lifestyle, um, I'm very attracted to it. I think, I think they're, um, it's beautiful what they're doing. Uh, they have great, I know guys that work with, with, um, the guys at Southern Oaks that do a lot of the videography and the photography and they're partners with them on some projects. Um, and they do stuff that just really appeals to me visually. Um, they're, it's very classy. Um, so I think I, I like that. It gives, it's a very good impression. Wild Rose is very similar. Wild Rose is, it, it, it is extremely traditional in what they've done. They've, I, I knew them when they were small. Um, I bought dogs with, from them when they were very small. Um, they've grown into a, a gigantic, in my opinion, like a, it's a, it's a really big brand. Um, and it, and there's nothing wrong with it. Now, my personal feeling is I'm a little bit, when it comes to dogs, I probably lean a little bit more towards the small side. Like I, I like, I like a little bit smaller niche type things. Um, I talked about Josh DeWitt before with Brookstone. I think he's along those lines. Um, there's a guy, um, well, Jeremy Crisco is is Blue Cypress, Robert Milner. He's Tennessee. Um, I haven't bought a dog from them in a long time. Um, they're, they've scaled, I believe, since since I've done business with them. Um, there's uh, Josh Miller is a, a kind of a, con- I, I feel like he's kind of a converted um, to the British style dog. Um, he's got a kennel. It's called, uh, Riverstone Kennels. Um, now they've got British dogs. They use collars and I've had conversations with Josh and I really like Josh. Um, and, and he uses collars on his dogs and I don't know if he has to quite honestly. And I don't know if he, it doesn't matter to me that he does. Um, 
But I that would be one of my questions. Would be do you you know do these dogs? If I were interested in getting a dog from him, I'd want to know if he felt like it needed to have a collar or not. Because if it needed to, I probably wouldn't be interested. If it didn't need one, I'd probably be interested. But that would be another one that I'd probably go see those dogs. I, I've got I've we, we've tried to connect a couple times. I probably still will make it over there in the next twelve months, but um, schedules have just gotten in in the way. But um, those are just a few names, and I like I said, I don't want to I don't want to turn this into a commercial um, for kennels because that's not that's not our thing. Um, hell, I I'm I'm to the point now where um, myself personally, like I talked about earlier, we're looking at building our own dogs, um, and and that's part of the process that I've I've gone through over the last few years is. Um, from doing some partnering breeding, I did I did breeding in partnership for a long time, and now we're looking at doing some individual unique breedings on our own. Um, it's selfish. It's on my end. It's just to build me the perfect dog for me, and me the perfect dog for me might not be the perfect dog for you. Maybe it is. I don't know, but um, I, I think it was a great question that Hannah had. I th- I hope this helps some of you guys that are in the market looking. Um, and, and wondering where do you start. Um, and, and I also want to go back and say, and, and I don't want to discount anything that I've just said, but I also don't want someone to listen to this and go, you're a snob, you're a, you're a dog snob. I'm not. I think you can, I think you can, my, one of the best dogs I ever had, and I, I say it with honesty, is she was an American dog. She came from a what I'd call a backyard breeder, um, it was a guy that had a really nice dog that he hunted a little bit with, and he bred it to his buddy's dog that hunted a little bit with it, and I got a puppy out of the paper. I mean, this is how this will date it. I, I had it. It was a newspaper, so I don't know when anyone puts layers in newspapers anymore. But I bought it out of the newspaper, and so and she turned into a really nice dog despite my training. And so I don't think you can't get good dogs like that, but I will say this. I'm in the business now that they have to be good. They can't even be, they, they can't even be good. They gotta be great. So I'm training dogs for clients for a lot of, they're expensive. And the amount of time and energy and effort and money that those people are putting into it and I'm putting into it, I have to be able to stack the deck in my favor the best I can when it comes to producing real high quality dog in the end. And I know I'm not foolish enough to think that I'm a good enough trainer to turn them all into that. I think you can make good dogs out of just about anything. Great dogs take 50% of the equation is the dog. 50% is me. I can only control my half. And and I'm not the best. So I'm trying to get better every day at it. But I, I wanna, I'm going to take the most talent I can get inherent instinctive natural because not only is it going to make my job easier a lot easier like it it, i'm all for making things easier when it comes to breeding these dogs training these dogs and that can come from breeding but it also is because it's going to give me that that dog already has those tools and it's going to it's going to allow me to not have to be the best trainer and still balance the idea of what i'm putting into the dog and what the dog has to get to the top of the pyramid as best we can. So I do think that there is a ton of value in good in good genetics, in good dogs, in good breeding. I think you can do it with all sorts of dogs. So don't don't I don't want you to think that I'm saying you have to have certain dogs from certain litters. I don't. I think you have to have the right dog for you from the right litter for you and for your style and for your training and for what you're going to do with them. I do think that is really important. So um that's it. It's probably our longest podcast we've ever done, but um, that's all right. We can we can get a little lengthy. I knew it would probably get a little long because I could have probably talked for double this on on this topic, um, but we're gonna cut it off. We're gonna be good. We're gonna we're gonna record another one. Ben's got to go home yet today anyway, so we're gonna record another podcast here. We I apologize for falling behind a little bit on these podcasts, but deer season will do that to you. Um, we've got about another week of muzzle loader here, muzzle loader season, and we're going to be hunting towards the end of the week. And, um, then after that, Ben and I have already had conversations of how do we, how do we kind of shift gears? Um, a lot of you guys know, we've got another brand that's called Hodeg. Hodeg is a 
a product line for deer hunting. Um, Licking Stick is our, our initial product and we're looking at growing that brand. Um, that has taken a lot of our time and energy and um, efforts this fall um, just because of the time of the year. But now, uh, Ben and I were just having a conversation earlier today. What are we going to do? We've got Bella Be Good, the series. We've got some other ideas and we've got some stuff that we've already done that we just haven't packaged um, to deliver. So what we're going to look at doing is we want to talk about how are we going to continue to give you guys more content, information, um, and, and the podcast was one of the ways that it came up. So we said we're going to make the point, getting back on the podcast train, recording more of these. Um, and so we thank you for following along with them. We thank you for helping us with them. Um, Hannah, this one is 100% in for Hannah um, and because of her question. So we've got another one that we're going to do here shortly. And um, So we thank you for that. We'll keep doing them if you guys keep following. So thanks again, and we'll talk with you soon.